Honestly, if I were you, I would just take a picture unless you want to write it all down. Uh, this is all important. So let me, um, to finish the historical kind of stuff that I began, what I know was only a week ago, but to me, because of being in the hospital for hours every day, literally seems like a year ago. Um, I believe we left off with getting to the year 1066. So I'm going to try to do this, this, and this part as quickly as possible. Um, name? Name? Amanda. Sorry. Last name? Jackson. Jackson. Sorry. I saw you chewing. I knew you didn't want to check. There you are. Um, January 1st, uh, excuse me, January 5th, 1066, Edward the Confessor dies. Okay? The next day, a man named Harold Godwinson is crowned king. I'm going to pause there. So hit that pause button. And talk about this for a moment. So I have to go back to a period slightly before this. According to the Bio Tapestry Booker, that's the name of this thing. I'm going to link to an image of it on D2L. I haven't yet. <clears throat> the Bio Tapestry, if, if I remember correctly, and both my parents died of Alzheimer's, so I'll tell you right now, it could be coming out of left field. Um, I'm 90% sure the bio tapestry was woven by English weavers, women, okay? It's named for bio because that's where it is. It's in, in a monastery or convent or church or something in bio France. It was woven or made shortly after the Norman Conquest, shortly after the year 1066, in other words, okay? It's not a tapestry like if this were a piece of cloth, you would say, oh, that's, well, that's not a personal word, but you'd say, oh, that's a nice tapestry. You know, you can go to Kirkland's and buy tapestry thing on your walls and stuff. It's not even a tapestry like if you were to go to Hampton Court Palace in Richmond, just outside London, with, that Henry VIII had built, excuse me, Cardinal Wolsey had built, which Henry VIII took from him when he had him executed, um, has tapestries you know, the length of that wall. It's a very, very famous one um, there. This tapestry is huge. I mean, you would look at that and go, well, that would be huge, right? Go to, totally different, I don't know why I do this, but go to the Harry Potter experience at a little town just outside London. Don't do the stupid one in Florida. Go to the real one where they have all the real props for all the films. I hate the films. Absolutely detest the films. I teach a Harry Potter course. I've taught it for 20 years. Taught it in London several times, okay? Go there because the props are absolutely amazing. And see the tapestry that hangs in the black house that has the whole black family genealogy. This thing is amazing. Where, you know, people's names are supposed to be burned out. They're literally burned out. Like someone took a big cigar and just melted the fabric. Anyways, the bio tapestry, name, last name? Freed. Say that again? Reed, R-E-I-D. Oh, Reed. I was looking for F. There you are, Lillian. Um, it's huge. It's 18 inches tall. So that's not huge, right? That's you know, kind of short. But it's something like 180 feet long. This is a single piece of cloth. All right. The bio tapestry tells the story of the Norman Conquest. And there is a panel in it. It's, it's divided into panels. Like, get a copy of the newspaper and look at the comics page. Look at any comic. And you've got pattern, you know, panels, right? And when people speak, there are little balloons up above. Well, the bio tapestry is kind of like that. It's got panels, okay? And then above and beneath the image that is depicted, there's Latin writing. Well, one of those panels shows, um, I'm not going to pull it out. 
a table. And on one side of the table is Edward the Confessor, King of England. On the other side of the table is William, Duke of Normandy. This supposedly occurred, this, them sitting on either sides of the table, sometime in mid-1050s. It's like 1053, 1055, something like that. And what the panel shows is, you know, one sitting here and one sitting here, and they've got the table. You know, and most tables have stretchers that connect the legs on this side with the legs on this side. I mean, you'll have a bar that goes across like this, and then something that goes across that makes the table stand. Well, sitting on the stretcher beneath the table is a Bible. All right? And it's suggested that whatever happens at this table... Because the Bible is sitting there, it becomes like a holy and sacred oath. Like, you know, what do you do if you have to become a witness in a court of law? You put your hand on the Bible and you raise the other hand and you swear. You know, if you're not a Christian, you're allowed to do it on other texts now. Um, and what the bio tapestry suggests is that when this event occurred, we don't know, if, if I remember correctly, we don't know that it actually occurred. It's what the bio tapestry told us. That Edward the Confessor promised to William of Normandy that should he, Edward the Confessor, die without heir, William of Normandy would become king of England. Okay? Why? What does he have to do with England? This is where, you know, genealogy is not so fun. Edward's mother and father were Emma and Athelred II. I mentioned Athelred last week. He was the guy who fled England 1014 or so when Svein Forkbeard and his son Canute invaded, and he fled to France. Why did he flee to France? Well, because it's right across the English Channel, mainly. And because his wife was from there. His wife is Emma of Normandy. All right? Emma of Normandy's father, Robert, I think it was, is the great, great grandfather of William of Normandy. So she, Emma, is his. What? I should ask my brother. He's a family genealogist. She's his great aunt, something like that, or whatever. That's his claim. Through his great-great-grandfather and through Edward's wife, essentially. Excuse me, Edward's mother, okay? So, Edward says, I die, no heir, you become king. January 5th, Edward dies. So leave the bio tapestry alone, and we're back to here. He dies. January 6th, the Vicon, okay, which is the Council, council of Advisors to the King. Now, does President Biden have a Council of Advisors? He's not King Biden, right? He's president. He does have a Council of Advisors. What are they called? Cabinet. His cabinet. Secretaries of the various departments. They advise him. He also has his national security, you know, council advisory staff and all that kind of stuff. Well, the council of advisors elects, because this is Germanic fashion, and in the Germanic fashion, even over in continental Germany at this time, king dies, the council elects the king. If the king has a son, guess who's elected? <laughs> yeah, here's... No, it's a no-brainer, okay? They elect a man named Harold Godwinson. Godwinson, son of Godwin, all right? His father had been the most powerful man in England, even kind of when Edward was king, kind of. Why? Largest landowner. You have a lot of land, it gives you a lot of power, all right? So they elect Harold Godwinson. Interesting thing is, Harold's not the eldest son. His older brother, Tosti, K 
T-O-S-T-I-G. It means testy, full of himself, all right? Petty is what that word testy means, okay? So he's full of himself. He's already left the country because he doesn't think he's ever going to become king because, you know, Edward's king, et cetera, et cetera. So Harold gets crowned, all right? Word spreads. Word reaches Normandy. I think it is late February, early March. That Edward the Confessor has died, and you're not king, meaning William of Normandy. Someone else has been elected king. He thinks he's been double-crossed. Because according to the bio-tapestry, Edward agreed you would become king upon his death. Harold Godwinson, no blood claim to the throne. William can at least go. Great, great, great. <laughs> All right. So, beginning around March 1066, William begins constructing a navy. He's going to invade. It takes a long time to build big ships. But before William, do, uh, before William does, in September of 1066, word reaches Harold, and I'm going to now emphasize a different pronunciation of the two Harold and Harald. This one's Norwegian, this one's English. Word reaches him, down in London, that an army is invaded in the north. And the army is led by his brother, Tosti, who's kind of pissed that his younger brother is king of England, and Harald Hardrada. I didn't mention that last name to my first class. Hardrada. Hard? Deeds is what his last name means. In other words, Harold, badass. <laughs> you, you don't mess with this guy. King of Norway. He's got a claim to the throne. Why? Canute and his son were kings of Norway and kings of England simultaneously. It hasn't been that long since Canute's son stopped being king. 1042, what, 24 years later, okay? So they've invaded, and Harold Godwinson has got to now march north about 180 miles and fight a battle. Sounds easy enough. First, he has to raise an army because he doesn't have a standing army. Nobody really had a standing army at this point. Why not? That's a logical, natural reason. If you have a standing, I don't mean you know, standing, you have a permanent army, what must you do for them? Yeah, you got to feed them. you got to house them. Okay? Big defense budget, in other words. So he has to raise the army as he marches north. What time of year is it? September 25th. Getting, what do you do this time of the year? You're bringing in the harvest. Why? Winter's coming. It's not like they can go down, I'll use a modern version, go down to the local Tesco, famous, you know, like 7-Eleven in England, throughout England. You can't do that. If you're going to survive through the winter, you survive on the basis of your own goods that you've stored up. You know, the ant and the grasshopper uh, old fable. So people are bringing in their harvest. He's got to get men to leave the fields and fight for him. He, he doesn't have enough personal troops. Think of, you know, what are called his house carls. Think of those kind of like as his personal Navy SEALs his personal protective unit, as it were, all right? So he raises what's called the feared, F-Y-R-D, if you want to write it down. He raises the feared on the way up. He raises that army for one purpose, to fight this battle. They get up there, September 25th, you have the, what's called the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Not the same Stamford Bridge that the English football team, Chelsea, fights at. That's the name of their stadium. That's in London. 
it's not Puebla. They defeat the northern invaders. Tosti is killed. Okay. And while they're up there, I think it's like a few days later, two or three days later, a writer comes up from London and tells Harold, William of Normandy has landed on the southeast coast. Okay, the southeast coast is about now 220 miles away. He raised the army to fight this battle. Now he has to march 220 miles south. And what else does he have to do? He has to raise another army. Because the guys who agreed to fight this battle, they've got to get back home and finish bringing in the harvest. So now he has to raise another army, and they've got to march even further. Takes him two weeks to march that 220 miles. Okay. You know, do the, do the math. 30 miles a day, most of that, most of those men, the vast majority, on foot. That's, that's long walks, okay? October 14th, 1066. You get what's called the Battle of Hastings, okay? Interestingly enough, it's not at Hastings. Hastings is about six miles away. The town that is there is called Battle. B-A-T-T-L-E. Battle of battle, that just doesn't have a ring to it, you know. So, very, very, very quickly. We're going to be so far behind today, it's going to blow your mind. Um, they get there, and the French have done something really stupid. The Normans. They're called Normans, by the way. Normans are the shortened version of North men. They settled on the northwest coast of France. Who's the they? They're descendants of Vikings. The Northmen, they came down from the north originally. Okay? So, if you go to battle today, if you ever go to London, take the train, go down to Hastings, about an hour long train ride, and go to the Battle of Hastings and go to the battle site, you can do the interactive thing where they give you like a walkie-talkie or headphones or something, and you walk around and they say, okay, stop at, you know, you stop, look to, and there'll be a sign pointing, and it'll tell you everything that happened there. The topography is different now than it was then because William the Conqueror changed it. it used to be a much steeper hill and kind of cliff. He leveled it out some, okay, and there's trees and brushes and, you know, a thousand years ago, so, so a, lot, a lot has changed. But you can still get an idea. One of the first rules, military strategy, if you're getting ready to prepare or fight a battle, one of the first rules is, if possible, get the high ground. If you can be up on a place up here, looking down at your enemy, the battle's nearly won right there. Because what do they have to do? They gotta go uphill. What will some of those fighters be wearing? Now, William's army are warriors. These aren't farmers. Harold's army, a lot of them are farmers. He does have his Navy SEALs. These, these guys you don't want to mess with, like Navy SEALs. I've had a couple of special ops guys in classes before. Ooh, the stories they would tell. Um, most of these, many of these, would be in armor. Not like you see, you know, the plate armor. That's all much later. Coat of mail. Steel rings woven together. Go to any national trust property in England today, and you could try on a coat of mail. I mean, they make them for six-year-old kids, or six-year-old kid can pretend he's a knight. Or they make them for, you know, 60-year-old men who want to see what it feels like. And you put one on my size, and they weigh usually minimum 50 pounds. Some of them a lot heavier, depending on how tight the mail is woven. Meaning the better mail, okay? You put a sword in your hand, and you've got another 10 to 15 to 20 pounds, depending upon the size of the sword. 
Because you didn't kill people with swords by really thrusting. You did it by beating them to death like a baseball bat. Okay? These aren't like fencing foils, where they're really thin, really sharp point. All right? And then maybe you have a helmet. Uh, could be another couple of pounds. So you're 60 to 100 pounds running uphill. You get tired very fast. Right? The English arrive, and they're like, what gives? Why didn't they take the high ground? Doesn't matter. They didn't. They thank their fortune. So the English take the high ground. They're looking down on the hill. And down below, so I'm Harold. I've got my house carls, my seals around me. And then the rest of the army goes off over here and over here. Down there, you got an open area. And over on this side, there's a copse of trees. And over on this side, a copse of trees, copse grow like of trees. They can't see what's beyond the trees. Okay? Then the French take this position here. The English form what's called their shield wall. That is, they link arms with this arm like this, and it's got a shield holding it. The guy next to him has this arm linked into this arm, has a shield. Always have one arm free, you know, so you can hold a weapon. If they maintain that shield wall, they can't be defeated. And by the way, this battle tactic, this goes back to the ancient Greeks, the phalanx, right? Battle takes one day. The French charge. And if you're a Monty Python aficionado, what do the French then do when the English repel them? Run away, run away, you know? And the French run because the English shield wall Stays firm. The French charge again. And then run away because they can't break the shield wall. The English shield wall stays firm. The French charge again. It's now late afternoon. And this time, for some unknown, inexplicable reason, the English shield wall breaks. They don't break because they're being attacked so hard. They break to chase the French. Good battle strategy on the part of William of Normandy. Because once the English start to chase the French, the French cavalry that cannot be seen because they're hidden by the trees come around on either side and do what's called a pincher movement, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Hammer, anvil, boom, and they slaughter the English. According to the bio tapestry, okay, another panel, Harold Godwinson dies because at some point he looks up and he's shot through the eye with an arrow. Dies on the spot. At the spot where he dies, William the Conqueror has an abbey built. Only the ruins are there today because of Henry VIII. We'll talk about what a horrible person Henry VIII was. Leave his wives out of it. For the destruction of the monasteries. And probably the loss of, it's been estimated, 90% of medieval English literature. 90%. So, you know, Beowulf we have and are down in the green mountain. There's probably a lot more like those gone because of what Henry did. So William has an abbey built there, and in the abbey, the altar, the high altar, is located on the exact spot, supposedly, where Harold Godwinson died. Why? Because he felt guilty. And he had prayers offered daily for Harold's soul. Probably has a good word put in for himself at the same time. Look how wonderful I am, God doing this for my opponent, etc. Okay? Then William gets crowned king December 25th, 1066. Why December 25th? Did it take him that long to pacify the rest of England? No, that took him a whole lot longer. He didn't get that done for nearly or over 20 years. Earls Counts and stuff up north, they kept uprising. Yes, hand. 
Charlemagne. Exactly. Charlemagne, Charles the Great, that's what Charlemagne means, um, was crowned on Christmas Day in the year 800. Founded the Holy Roman Empire. It's actually the second Holy Roman Empire. You know, wasn't really holy. <laughs> Definitely wasn't Roman. But, but the first Holy Roman Empire wasn't really holy. It was Roman. Anybody know what the third Holy Roman, supposedly, empire was? The Third Reich. The Third Reich. The Third Kingdom. That's what that Reich means. Hitler. Okay? Supposedly. Definitely not holy. And definitely not Roman. Uh, anyways, so he did it on, ten, on December 25th, kind of modeling himself after Charlemagne. Okay? Um, little difference is that Charlemagne handed the crown to the Pope and then essentially said, give it back. You put it on my head. Why? What does that symbolize? Keep going. The Pope and the church are beneath the king. Okay? Um, William was crowned by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes? Did the Pope like get it willingly? No. Oh. What do you know about Charlemagne? <laughs> uh, he baptized by the sword. In other words, become a Christian or die. And sometimes become a Christian and die. <laughs> like, become a Christian so that when I kill you, at least you'll go to heaven. Good. Holy? Mm, not so much. All right? So, uh, that's all that. Now I can erase this because I'll probably at some point need the board. <clears throat> so if the English U wall had held, we probably wouldn't be spelling or couldn't spell the modern English word fish this way. And I'm getting looks going, what the hell is he smoking? This? How, how can you spell fish this way? I don't mean the, what the word literally means, sound. Where do we see G-H as f? <coughs> Enough. Enough, cough, G-H. O sounds like if, in a lot of words, T-I, nation. T-I. Makes no sense whatsoever, right? Because in Old English, you know how you spell fish? It, it, and S-C always is shh when it comes to the end. If it's at the beginning of a word, because of Old Norse, later, it's sk. Skin, scar, okay? This, because of influence or because of Middle English? Why, what happens with Middle English? The Old English language had already, was going through a transformation, changing, why? Because all languages change at all times. All of them do. This is history of English language in a two minute nutshell. It had already started changing. It was dropping endings to words, changing emphasis, you know, word pronunciation, um, inflection is done, things like that, okay? With the Norman conquest, you know, I mentioned that it took William 20 years to finally take care of, pacify the English. Why did it take 20 years? What, what do I mean by pacify? At the end of that 20 year period, there were no English aristocracy alive. The English aristocracy, the upper class, put it that way, decapitated, gone, dead, all replaced with French, Norman, Normans. That's why we have words today like count and duke and viscount in English. All comes from Norman. The old English words for that kind of level, Jarl or Earl. Okay? That's why we have, you know, name different names for the same thing. Warranty, guarantee. Actually, those are two different kinds of phrases. So 
Norman English comes into English and dominates. Dominates. Norman French, sorry, not Norman English, Norman French. Norman French is the language of government, the language of culture, the language of religion, the language of society, essentially, for about 300 years. You want to get somewhere, you want to get along, you learn French, all right? It's the reason why Old English, knicht, notice, knicht, every letter is what? It's pronounced. There are no silent letters at all in Old English. Becomes Middle English, knicht. Notice the difference between and becomes modern English, night. Why? Well, you could say because it's easier, but one of the reasons is because the big, what's the biggest change there? Sound. Which ones? Well, uh, the, I mean, K for instance, and then the sound. It gets dropped, right? And Entirely. Because you don't call this thing a knee. C-N-E-O is the Old English canal. And if you understand something, you don't say I canal. C-N-A-W, which is the Old English, or C-N-A-W-A-N, to know. You say I K-N-O-W, but it sounds like no. So if you're talking with somebody, how do you know the difference between that and that? Context becomes everything, okay? Well, this sound, the French didn't like, because they don't really have the <sighs> How do you say hour in French? Well, take that back, can't even use that one. Because modern English hour, H-O-U-R, notice, how did you know which word I was saying? Was I saying H-O-U-R or O-U-R? Context. Well, H-O-U-R, H-O-U-R comes from H-E-U-E-R in French. How do you say that? Ur. Hors duvers. Or du. You don't pronounce the H. No English word begins with the... Ah. Sorry for the spat on you. Doesn't begin with that H sound. What's the H there for? It indicates that, that aspiration. So they hear that, and they think someone is clearing their throat. So it becomes The reason it drops out is another, there's another thing involved there in later Middle English to modern English that we don't have time to get to. So if the Norman conquest had not occurred, and everything went on kind of naturally, as it might have, modern English spelling would not be nearly as chaotic and unpredictable unreasonable as it is. I mean, just think of the O-U-G-H. They can have five different pronunciations. Depending on the word, right? Uh, okay, so we're done with all the Middle English and what I'm going to say about the Middle English and all that. A couple other things before we get to <coughs> uh, the Wanderer. Yeah, I'll do this one first. C.L. Wren, C.L. Wren, Anglo-Saxon scholar, 1960s, wrote a book called A Study of Old English. He had been a student, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he'd been a student of J.R.R. Tolkien's and then replaced Tolkien as the uh, chair of Old English at Oxford. He wrote a book called A Study of Old English, and in that he has a chapter that discusses what he calls the fourfold Germanic ethic. Now, what do we mean when we talk about ethics? If something is ethical, then it's what? Moral. Okay, so what do we mean by that? You're a, okay, and even that. You're talking about relationships between people. Human ethics is about how you interrelate with other people. Okay? Politics is about power relations between people. Ethics is about kind of interpersonal relationships. 
If you're a good person, that kind of means you get along well and other people like you. If you're a bad person, the opposite, right? More or less. I mean, bring in Dr. Bombardi or one of the philosophy professors and they'll, you know, want to have these strung up. Um, too much simplification. So, this ethical behavior, how one behaves in relation to others, has four components. First, foremost, duty to your Lord. Now, Lord just means the leader of your group. It might be the chieftain. It might be the king. It might be the king. That is, you might have a bunch of lesser kings and a high king. Okay? Could be either of those. But you have a duty to that person. The flip side of that is the Lord also has a duty to you. If you are a thane or warrior, what's part of your duty to your Lord? Louder? Protect. Fight the battles. I mean, what should... I should... Well, I guess I... What should you know if you join up today to the military? Or what should you assume? What might happen? Okay, that's taking it to the extreme. You, you might have to go fight, right? It's not just, I'm going to sign up. Why? Because they'll pay for me to go to med school. There's a little something between A and B. You know, you got to put the uniform, learn how to shoot, possibly go to war. And if you survive, then they'll pay for med school kind of a thing. Okay? So the Lord has to reciprocate. How does the Lord do that? You go off, you fight the battle, you win the battle, you get all this treasure, you bring it back to the Lord, the Lord goes through it and goes, here, you get this. Well done, you know. That's how, right? Duty to kin. Who's kin? Family. family. Who's family? Well, the Lord might be literally part of your family. Not necessarily. Is it what we call today the nuclear family or it's, you know, even more immediate, your biological family? Can be. It can also be more extended. It can be your clan. What's one of the, you know, supposedly the greatest feud in American history? The Hatfields and McCoys. Okay? Even though generations exist. So duty to kin, it could be your brother, or it could be your third cousin five times removed, or mother, or father, or sister, or son, or daughter, etc. Third, duty, duty to avenge one's lord and or kin. Now, notice this implies what has happened. Somebody has done something to your Lord or your kin. Murder, maybe. Rape, maybe. Theft, maybe. Okay? So, well, let's use an Old Testament biblical idea. Not German, even though this is entirely Germanic, okay? But it's part of this honor culture that seems to be worldwide. If you know the Old Testament story of, I can't remember the father, the guy with 12 sons, Jacob with his 12 sons, they go into a town, the townsman, son of the elder of the town, looks at the guy's daughter and says, man, is she ever hot. I want to marry her, but he rapes her. And the brothers find out and they say, oh, well, we'll let you marry her, but, you know, we're Jews, so you got to be circumcised first. And the guy's like, she's really hot, man. I do love her. Yes, yes, I'll be, no, no, not just you. All the men in the town have gotten, and the other guys are probably going, well, you're marrying her, I'm not, okay. They agree. But what do the brothers do when all the men are incapacitated from being circumcised? slaughter them all. That's a perfect perception or um, portrayal of that idea. It's, you know, the old Sean Connery, um, Kevin Costner, uh, The Untouchables film about the FBI 
back in the time of L.A. and S. in the 1930s. You touch one of mine, we touch two of yours. You bring a knife to a fight, we bring a gun. You bring a gun, we bring a Tommy machine gun. In other words, we're always going to one-up you. Who wins, ultimately, in that kind of mentality? Nobody. Why? Because you annihilate each other. Okay? That's what happens. Which we'll see when we get to the end of Beowulf, by the way. So, duty to avenge your work or kin. Lastly, and I, I can never come up with a verb, so I use three. Belief in, reliance on, trust in, this notion of weird. Weird, as it's pronounced. Not modern English, weird. Weird. Sounds close. What is weird? Faith. Louder? Faith. Fa are you saying faith or fate? Faith. In what? Because faith always has an object. Well, this is weird. <laughs> The book, the poem, the introduction talks about fate. And you're going to get a translation. Weird is fully fixed, which I'm going to disagree with the translation in a moment. Well, assuming we get there. Fate is kind of the best. Okay, so what's meant by fate? Destiny. destiny. What's meant by destiny? I'm going to be a two-year-old. Why? <laughs> Why? Why? Something you can't change. I kind of think the best way to define this, what will be, will be. Yeah, period. <laughs> end, of, end of statement. In the Greek system, in the ancient Greek system, you know, you have the gods, you have humans down here, playthings of the gods, and you have the gods, and you have fate. Notice how I'm putting this. Gods, fate, humans. Fate isn't behind the gods. The gods aren't over fate. The gods don't control fate. The gods can see fate. They're, they know what's going to happen. They can tell us. Sometimes they do. Why? Just to mess with our minds. To say, well, this is going to happen. Because they know, what are you going to try to do, probably, if you're told something bad is going to happen tomorrow? Change it. What's the greatest example of that? Anybody know from Greek literature? Oedipus. Oedipus. Oedipus the king by Sophocles. The myth was known long before Sophocles wrote his play. Okay? What happens in the play? Oedipus's life, in a nutshell. He's in his mother's womb. His mother and father receive a prophecy. Prophecy is, the one in your womb is going to kill you, Laius, father, and is going to marry and sleep with and produce children by you, your Costa, mother. So his brothers and sisters are going to be his sons and daughters. And mother and father, your Costa and Laius are like, no, no, it's not going to happen. So the child is born. Notice what they don't do, by the way, which was practiced in ancient Greece. They don't abort him. Okay? And they don't immediately slit his throat when he comes out. The baby's born, and they drive a nail between his ankles. That's why he's named Oedipus, the clubfoot. His ankles are swollen, both of them, because of the calcification caused by the wound. So it kind of blocks life. Um, they have a servant, take him to a mountainside, to leave him on the mountain for the wild animals to eat. Servant finds a servant of somebody else. He gives them to them because he feels sorry for the kid. And he gets taken off to another city and raised. He's raised in that other city by a king and queen who treat him like their own. He never knows that he's adopted. Until there's a party. And some drunk stands, oh, you're a bastard adopted. And he's like, what? His parents say, don't worry about it. He goes to the oracle at Delphi. You can still go to Delphi today. There's not an oracle there, but you can still go. <laughs> and the oracle tells him, you are fated to kill your father and sleep with your mother and bring to light a brood that should never be born. 
And he's like, uh, no. <laughs> what does he not do at that point? He doesn't go home and tell dad and mom, Polybus and Merope, I was just at the oracle and the oracle told me, because if he had, we wouldn't have the play and we wouldn't have the myth. Because if he had done that, what would any rational parent have said and done? Oh yeah, you're adopted. We, we haven't told you that. And if he was told he was adopted by his parents, he wouldn't have fled from home because he doesn't want to kill his father and he really doesn't want to sleep with his mother, notwithstanding everything Freud says, which is based upon one line in this play about sons having dreams about sleeping with their mothers. And then the electric complex, that's the Oedipal complex, and then the electric complex is about daughters wanting to replace their mothers in their father's beds, okay? You know, equal opportunity, incest. Um, so he flees from home, solves the riddle of the Sphinx after killing a man, so you're told you're going to kill your father and sleep with the mother. What two things do you never do? Kill someone. Kill someone? Kill I mean, if I'm told I'm going to kill my father and sleep with my mother, all the women in this room, I could kill you all. In fact, all the men in this room, I could kill you all. Why? You're not old enough to be my father. So we could, you know, we could be a little more generous. We could say, don't kill any man old enough to be your father. And don't sleep with any woman old enough to be your mother. And I don't know, you can be really conservative and say, so any guy who's 10 years older than me, and stretch the boundaries a little bit, and any woman old enough to be 10, just don't touch. But he doesn't do that. And the whole play is about figuring out who is the cause of the plague on the city of Thebes, and when he finds out, he puts his eyes out. Why? What's the point? You can't outrun fate. That's one point. The other point is life, from one of my favorite films of all time, life is pain. Highness, anybody know the film? Princess, Princess Bride. Bride, okay. Oedipus ends, count no man blessed till he is dead. Free of pain at last, all right? One other thing before I talk about the myth. So let me ask you again. How many of you, so a couple of people came in. How many of you saw the entire discussion about bead on the video I posted the other day? Okay, not all. Hmm? You have that time. In Bede's discussing, discussion of the coming of Christianity, he portrays the decision by Edwin to become a Christian as the result of competing stories. What are the competing stories? What was Edwin prior to becoming Christian? His wife, by the way, was Christian. She was the daughter of Clovis, King of Gaul, I think it was. He was pagan, Germanic pagan, all right? So what's pagan Germanic mythology say about reality, ultimate reality? What is in the cosmos? Well, it seems like it doesn't really matter because if you die, fight and die in war, you just go to Ragnarok, um, in which case um, you have a final battle at the end of time and you lose. Right. So okay. Really okay. So let me let me back up a little bit. You've got the gods, and there are two different kinds of gods. There's the work called the Aesir and the Vanir. We're not going to go into the distinctions between them. Kind of good, kind of on the side of humanity. Okay. Then you have humans. You got animals and plants and all that kind of stuff. And then you have these other beings. You've got dwarves, not people who have dwarfism. But dwarves, you have elves who are not good. In the Germanic system, elves are not good. Don't think Tolkien, OK? 
okay? Elves are bad. You have Orkneas, <coughs> which is where Tolkien gets the name Orcs from. You have, you know, what we would call um, trolls, okay? Um, you have the Frost Giants, okay, who are bad. Trolls are bad. Elves, dwarves are bad. Orkneas are bad. Frost Giants are bad, etc. Valhalla is the place that slain warriors go to when they die in battle. If you're a warrior and you die on a sick bed, oh man, it's the worst thing that can happen because you won't go to Valhalla. Valhalla literally means Val comes from the Old English or from the Norse. Val, Old English, Val means slaughter, death, if you want. Okay? Hala, Hall, the Hall of Death. It's where those who are slain in battle go to when they die. And what do they do in Valhalla? Party, man. Think of the biggest frat party and put it on steroids and drugs. Just amp that sucker up, okay? Big, huge party. For all time. It doesn't end. All right? And then Ragnarok comes around. Only comes around once. It's not like, you know, Halloween every year. Ragnarok comes. There are specific conditions that set into play I'm not going to talk about. Take the stupid Thor movie out of your mind if you've seen it. Um, Ragnarok comes around, and Ragnarok's the end of the world. Ragnarok is the ultimate final battle between the forces of good against the forces of evil. And in most of the versions of the story, evil wins. Good is destroyed. Good is utterly wiped out. I mean, entirely. There isn't a remnant who comes back. No. It's evil win, frost giants, dwarves, elves, or win, turn out the lights, story over. That's it. Smiley face, positive, hopeful, right? Not so much, okay? That's the majority pagan Germanic mentality. So what's there to look forward to tomorrow? Yeah, not a lot, okay? Kind of bleak, which is why fame is so important. You only live on through fame, through the good words spoken about you, so to speak, okay? So these Christians come in, and they've got a different story. And Bede recounts how Paulinus talks with the priest, the high priest, this guy named Coifi. And the king says, you know, i got to talk to my priests and see what they say. And Coifi says, essentially, you know, I've been a priest of our religion for a long time. And if our religion was true, Seems like my life would be better than it is. Because I do everything for you, O king. And yet, you give preferment, you give gifts, you give awards to all these other schlubs. And I get diddly. And if my religion was true, I'd be getting something. Okay? And then another priest, I think it is, says, you know, O king, I think life's like this. And he tells a story, another story. Our life is like a sparrow. And the sparrow flies, and it's dark, and it's stormy, and it's snow, and hail, and frost. And the sparrow flies through a window in a hall. And when it flies through the window, it experiences light. It experiences warmth. It experiences laughter. It hears a revelry and song. And it keeps flying. Because it doesn't stop. It keeps flying, and it gets to the end of the hall, the end of the hall, and it flies through another window. Window is just an opening. It's not like glass, okay? And it goes where? Back out into the chaos. The storm, the cold, the freezing, the snow, etc. He said, and our life now is like the sparrow in the hall. We don't know where we came from, and we don't know where we're going. But this guy, talking about the priest, he tells us where we've come from, 
ultimately God, creation story, think Cadman's hymn. What is Cadman's hymn about? It's not about God, per se. It's about God's creation. Okay? Kind of interesting, because Cadman's hymn, what it talks about, is the thing that in the Old English poem Beowulf, initially in the poem, sets off Grindel. The people in the hall are singing about creation, and it pisses Grindel off. I kind of like to think they're singing Cadman's hymn. Okay. Anyways, he says, this guy's story tells us where we've come from, ultimately, God, about life here now, and the important part, Because what comes next in the Christian story for believers? Is it death, darkness, slaughter, chaos, cold, hail, frost? No. Go back to that image of Valhalla, the ultimate frat party kegger. Okay, now just to the nth degree, read the end of the book of Revelation. What's it about? I don't mean, don't, all the prophecy, not, don't, don't go there. The wedding feast of the Lamb is what? Eternity. What's that an image of? Revelry. Think of the best get-together you've ever had with friends or family where, where there was no disagreement, just fun and love and happiness for all time. That's the image. And he goes, which one do you want to choose, O king? I'm going with the one that has some love and happiness. And It's a better option. It's a better story, he suggests. Okay? That's essentially the, you know, what B says about the story. Okay, one other thing before we get into... I'm skipping something with you guys that I did not skip it my first time. I don't know what it is. To um, the wanderer. We've got to discuss the role of the hall in Anglo-Saxon society. We don't have an equivalent today. Um, well, no, we don't have an equivalent. The hall is central not only to society, but to one's identity. Okay. The hall is where the king resides, or chieftain. And I, the, the way I've got to talk about hall, I've got to talk about it both in the context of the wanderer and seafarer, but also when we get to it in Beowulf. See, the wanderer is written within a Christian context, I think. <coughs> there are some scholars who don't, and I'm going to argue why they're wrong. Seafarer is definitely written within a Christian context. Beowulf is written by a Christian looking back on a pre-Christian time. But because it's written by or composed by, well, some people don't think so. I'll argue why they're wrong. Because it's written or composed by a Christian looking back in a pre Christian time, that author, composer, can't remove his or her Christian ideas slash presuppositions. Right? And the Hall figures prominently in all of these works because it, again, it's the source of one's identity. Let me go back to ancient Greece for a moment. Yes? So this hall that you're talking about, this is like, are you saying that it's like the ultimate place to go to, like when you're watching them, for everyone? Like whatever one individual well, needs? Well, not in terms of this hall. Okay. This, this hall is a physical building. Oh, okay. Like a lodge. A wooden construction. I put a picture on D2L today, under the Anglo-Saxon stuff, the old English stuff, uh, titled Trelleborg, and then it's like Trelleborg II. One of them is the picture of an inside of a reconstructed Viking hall in Norway or Denmark. Take that back, might be Sweden. Anyways, you get the image of the inside of the hall, okay? And then you have an image of the outside, and you see these big wooden planks leaning upright like this, just next to each other. Probably what an Anglo-Saxon hall looked like. Don't think castle. It's, it's not. It's made of wood. That's why they're easy to destroy. You light a match, and 
they're gone, okay? Here, I'm talking about a physical hall. We'll talk about a metaphorical hall a little bit later. I mean, the Valhalla, the great hall, heaven, okay? That's the metaphorical hall, where one has a Lord, where that Lord reigns eternally, and where that Lord dispenses gifts. Same kind of. There are some mythographers, people who write about, study myths, etc., who suggest that Germanic mythology might ultimately come from interaction with Christian ministries, uh, missionaries, early Christian missionaries. The earliest Germanic writing, runic writing, something like 200 AD. Okay, I mean Odin, chief of the gods, the All Father, <laughs> the Sky Father. What does Odin do to get his wisdom? Anybody know? He hangs on a tree for nine days and gets wisdom. Hey, Jesus tree, you know. Anyways, so the hall, it's the, it's the locus of society. I was going to go back for a moment to ancient Greece for, again for a minute. How many of you know about anything about Socrates? Okay. Socrates was forced to drink hemlock by the Athenian Senate because he led the people astray. Primarily because he led the youth astray. How do you lead them astray? He got them to think. He got them to question authority. He got them to question the belief systems. He was charged with you know, being an atheist. He's like, how can I be an atheist when I say there's one God? One God doesn't mean no God. It means one God. I don't believe in all the other Greek gods. They're nothing but superhumans with all human problems. Look at the gods. Zeus, man, screwing around, literally, cows and swans and, you know, all kinds of stuff, okay? So they force him to drink hemlock. His followers, Plato among them, buy off his guards, according to the Apology, okay? I think it's the Apology. They pay his guards to let him escape. But to escape, what must Socrates do? What must he leave? His version of the hall. His version of the hall, however, is called Athens. He has to leave Athens. And Socrates essentially says, if I leave Athens, I leave myself. I leave who I am. He is defined by being an Athenian. See, if you weren't in Athens, if you were a native Athenian and you weren't in Athens, you were, to use a term that's going to be used in the Wanderer, an exile. You became a, in a sense, a barbarian. One of those out there. Okay? Um, oh, I know what, where I lost the time because I talked about something else in the first class dealing with us and them. Let me pause here for a minute. Go back to this. Who is one's kin, ultimately? I mean, blood, right? Could be blood kin, family, you know, that kind of thing. Could be those who speak like me, same language. Could be those who believe like me. You know the root word for both Ireland, or as they call themselves, Air, E-I-R-E, -E, and Iran? The root for both of those goes back to Proto Indo European. It has an like an IR or AR. It has a, a modern English cognate. Both the IR in Ireland and the ear in Iran are related to Aryan. Doesn't mean white supremacist. <laughs> Doesn't mean neo Nazi. Doesn't. What's the vowel er? in Proto-Indo-European ultimately mean us. It's the us, as opposed to the them. So the Irish, in that mentality, are the us, <laughs> there. Does that mean that there aren't French who are the us? No, it just means they don't use that term. It's every us group. For example, one of the us groups in here could be all the women, 
right? Because I'm not a woman. I'm not part of that us. Or it could be all the men, because they're not part of... Or it could be all the white people, all the people with blonde hair, or all the people with... I almost said blue hair again. Mm -hmm. uh, black hair, or I... Whatever. It can define... Okay? So that can thing, again, it's us. Duty to avenge my kin can be my group. It can be more than just your little nuclear family. So it can be, you attack my country, notice, expand that out, I'm going to respond. You kill my lord, my president, my chieftain, my follower, or my religious leader. Have we gone, have we left this? The modern world, have we said, oh, this is all just BS, it's just nonsense. Hell no. It's still around, okay? Largely because it's fourfold Germanic, but it's older. It goes back to Indo-European probably, okay? Back to the hall then. The hall is where the local king, chieftain, etc., rules. I mean, literally has a big chair there where everybody else sits on littler chairs or benches. He, he, it is he, has a throne. We're going to hear a word in Beowulf to describe that throne. Yearly Christian. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about it when we get to it. It's from that seat that he dispenses wisdom and justice and gifts. Justice, for example, she and she might come in and she says, this book is mine. And she says, no, it's not. Look, it's close to me. It was my book, and she took it. And the king weighs between those two claims and pronounces judgment. Or it might be, you know, like Solomon. She stole my baby. No, she stole my baby. Well, then, let's split the baby. No, you know, that king. Okay? It's where he dispenses gifts. The warriors come back from a raid. They brought all the treasure. And he sits there, and he starts handing it out. Okay. That hall is like Athens. It determines the identity of the people associated to it. So what happens if that hall is destroyed? What nearly happened, kind of. I mean, this is exaggeration. What nearly happened on 9-11? What would have happened if flight, whatever it is, 93, hadn't been taken down over Pennsylvania? Where... Is it assumed it was headed? One of two locations. Both in Washington, D.C. White House? White House? Pentagon. Or Pentagon was already hit. Congress. The Capitol. Pentagon was bad, but most people didn't, you know, shed a lot of tears. Being facetious. What if it had taken out the White House? I mean, you'd think the United States was pissed at 9-11. What if they're taking out the Capitol, the people's house, you know, so to speak, as all of our lying politicians call it? Uh, sorry, little editorial comment there. <laughs> Bombs galore, right? I mean, there'd be glass factories in the middle of the Middle East at this point, because that's all that would be there. What if a foreign leader assassinated an American president? Hasn't happened yet. They've tried. Hussein threatened both Clinton and George Bush the Elder. Notice who's around. <laughs> okay. Um, because that person is metaphorically now the leader of the hall. All right. Again, you can't escape this. I mean. You know, we, we get that mentality kind of, oh, I'm from Tennessee. I'm a Tennessean. So I'm from California. I've lived in Tennessee for over 30 years, or for 30 years. I still think of myself as a California. I haven't lived in California since 1983 or 4. It's a long time, 20 years before most of you were born, okay? <clears throat> so just wrap your mind around this. This is really, really, really important to have this, have this idea, okay? Now, 
the wanderer. Any questions at this point? Any, please just shut the hell up let us out. <laughs> the wanderer survived, one copy. You know, I mentioned Henry VIII. Probably a reason why most of our old English literature survives, and Middle English survives, is only one copy. Because when Henry VIII destroyed the monasteries, the books that the monasteries preserved were destroyed. The wanderer survives in what's called, yes? Did he like want to do that intentionally to like destroy that literature? Or was it just kind of like a byproduct? Partially. Um, let me hold off on that, because there's the last minute. One of his advisors, who was a real staunch Protestant, I mean, really staunch, they made the Salem witch trials look like, you know, kindergarten cupcakes. Um, whose, whose idea it was to what's called dissolve the monasteries, to break up the monasteries. One of the things he wanted to do was to have all the books that were in the monasteries destroyed. Because the monasteries at that time were Catholic. He was a staunch Protestant. He wanted to get rid of anything that smacked of Catholicism. Anything. Well, the books were written by, Protest by Catholics. Right? Because there, there weren't any Protestants prior to 1570. Sorry if you're Baptist, Methodist, whatever. You know, your church doesn't exist before Martin Luther 1570, when he begins the Protestant Reformation. We'll talk about that when we get up to the Renaissance. Um, the Wanderer is preserved in what's called the Exeter Manuscript. Why? Because it's in Exeter, England. It's at the cathedral in Exeter, England where it has been since the 11th century. We know who actually gave the book to the monastery, and it was the Bishop of Exeter, a guy named Leverage. He's mentioned in your introduction. Okay? There are four main, what are called, poetic, <coughs> poetic, codices, where you can be crude and say, Codexes. Codex, plural, is uh, codices. Um, we would call it a book. It's not a book, though. Okay? These are manuscripts. All handwritten. There are four main ones. The Exeter Manuscript, the Junius Manuscript. So this is in Exeter. This is in Oxford. Okay? The Richelli Manuscript, which is in Richelli, Italy. It doesn't have any Italian in it. It's all Old English. Not exactly sure how it got there, but it's there. And then what is often just usually called the Beowulf manuscript. For the simple reason it has Beowulf. It's got five other things, but the most important one for most people is Beowulf. Okay? These all date from approximately 1000 AD. If you want to be a little more accurate, you could say 975 to 1020. All four of these. Some of them contain not only poetry, but the Beowulf manuscript also contains prose. Okay? Exeter is one of the biggest ones. It's got a ton of stuff. All the riddles, for example. And there's over 60 riddles um, that survive from Old English, which tells us they liked riddles. That's why there are riddles in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, by the way. So the Wanderer is in the Exeter manuscript, and the next poem we're going to read, The Seafarer, is also in that manuscript. They're both called lyrics, and they're both called elegies. Now, we kind of think of it as a lyric, like a modern lyric, is what? It's a song. It's words to generally a short song. Try to sing this sucker. It's going to take you a while. It's a pretty long song. Modern lyric is kind of a, you know, an expression of emotion. So to speak. It might be about a love gone bad, a love gone good, a love, you know, most of them are about love in one way or another. This is not about love. All right? They're also, both the wanderer and the seafarer, are called elegies or an elegy. What is an elegy? Anybody? If you don't know, that's fine. 
It is an expression of sorrow for something that has been lost. Okay. Notice, if you change that first vowel, what do you often have said at funerals? A eulogy. Okay. A eulogy is a beautiful word. The e eh in elegy, I think, comes from away or from. It's a word away, a word that is, it's a word indicating a lack of something. It is a phrase, a story, a song, a poem, an elegy about something that's been lost. Now, that could be anything. You can write an elegy about my lost keys that you can't find. You can write an elegy about a long lost love. Read some of Shakespeare's most beautiful sonnets. 30 or 31, which I just had opening lines and they're gone. Um, you can read, you can write an elegy about, uh, you know, a pet that has died or about, you know, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. Anybody know what that is? Walt Whitman about the death of Lincoln. It's one of the greatest elegies in the English language. I mean, it is just fantastic. Okay. So it's a also because it's mourning the loss of something, it is a lament. L-A-M-E-N-T. You have in the Old Testament, the lamentations. What are they? They are Jeremiah weeping over the loss of Jerusalem. Okay? So, lamentation is a mournful sorrowing, a pouring out of grief, and a lament is the same. So, the wanderer is a lament. It is a lamentful elegy. It's an elegy and a lament. The seafarer is not as much a lament as the wanderer is. And you're going to see why in just a few moments. So, look at anything else here. Now, look at the first few lines. Translation reads, and then I'm going to read the Old English opening lines. Always the one alone longs for mercy. This is page 66. The maker's mildness, though troubled in mind, across the ocean ways he has long been forced to stir with his hands the frost-cold sea and walk in exile's path. Uh, excuse me, paths. Weird is fully fixed. So your gloss tells you, your first gloss for the phrase, longs for mercy. The Old English word, yibidon, translated longs for mercy, can also mean awaits or experiences. The word are, mercy, can also mean prosperity in earthly sense. In other words, material wealth. Okay? The Old English, for those five lines, reads, Oftim on haga are yibidon. So, always the one alone longs for mercy. Old English, oft. What's that sound like? Often. Okay. But here it's translated always. Oft can mean always, depending upon context. The context here doesn't require it to be always. It can be often. The reason I'm emphasizing that is because when we get to line, nine, line eight, the same word is going to be translated often, not always. Okay? Why? Well, hold on to that thought for just a second. So, often, or always, the one alone longs for mercy. Often, him on haga, okay, him, it's male, on haga, alone. The on means by himself. On haga is kind of like moving. So the, the one moving alone, the solitary one, are yabideth which leaves it translated, 
longs for mercy. All right, Yabedeth. And he tells us, Yabedeth can mean longs for, his translation, awaits or experiences. All right, can mean um, prosperity. Next footnote. Uh, mercy can also mean prosperity. Let's look at the first word first. All right. It can also mean favor or grace. Okay. So often the solitary one, mercy, order in which they're written, mercy, prosperity, favor, or grace, verb. The verb, yebedeth. He translates longs for. And then says it can also mean awaits or experiences. It can also mean expects. Okay? I think, I will argue, you don't have to agree. This line, or this opening first line and a half, the next half line, me totas milza. He translates the maker's mildness. Okay? Can also be translated the measurer's mildness. How you translate this first line and a half will determine fate. How you translate the entire rest of the poem. Or should. How you determine, how you translate these words will influence everything else. Why? Go back to Bede for a moment. When Bede translated, when Bede gave us Cadman's hymn, did anybody remember what he said? Did he say, this is it exactly? What did he say? He says, this is the gist. Why? Bede's writing in Latin. When Cadman delivered his, assume for a moment Cadman is real. When Cadman delivered his hymn, he wasn't speaking Latin. How do we know? Because he was an unlearned herdsman. Unlearned. He had no teaching. He didn't know how to read or write. And he sure as hell didn't know Latin. So he spoke in Old English. B gives us the Old English hymn in Latin and tells us this is the gist of it. Why? Because you can't get the full real meaning in a translation. B says, you want the real thing? Learn Old English. And I would add, you want to understand B? Learn Latin. He wrote in Latin. Okay? You want to understand anything written in any other foreign language, and you want to understand it like a native, that means, drives the crud out of me because I don't know all the languages that I'd like to know, it means you have to learn that language. When I used to teach the old English Beowulf secrets to my graduate students, a lot of those students were AP English teachers who taught. Beowulf in AP English, and they would be like wrapping rolls of duct tape around their head because they're going, I never knew this is what Beowulf meant because they were using some translation. And now they were going and looking at the words, looking at all the different meanings for individual words because most of those meanings or many of those meanings have dropped out in the thousand years since Beowulf was written down. All right? We don't use them in that sense. So, Look, just look at the first line. Often the one alone, leave the object alone for a moment. Look at the verb. Ye be death, okay, longs for. What's the difference between longing for mercy, awaiting mercy, experiencing mercy, or expecting mercy? If you're longing for mercy, what hasn't happened yet? You don't have it. Okay? If you're awaiting mercy, it could be you know it's coming. It could be you think it's coming, but it might not be. If you experience mercy, you have it. If you're expecting mercy, there's an indication that you might have been told that it's coming, but it hasn't come yet. I, I'm going to ask a question. You may not know the answer to that's fine. 
What's the greatest mid 20th century work of the, the, the genre of drama called the theater of the absurd? Anybody know? Irish writer Samuel Beckett, Waiting for Godot. Okay? Godot is usually assumed to be God. And you have these two characters on this empty stage with one prop, a bare tree, who spend the entire play talking about waiting for Godot and what we can do to make the time have meaning. And one of them actually says, I, I don't mean to be crude or anything, one of them actually says, you know, we can go hang ourselves because then at least we'll get an erection. Well, something fun will happen. Wow, dying, okay, so weird. But it'll be something. Why? Because nothing's happening. It's theater of the absurd. Theater of the absurd says life has no meaning. It never will, it never can. Deal with it and go on. And they wait. Okay? The, the difference between all of these and this one are huge. If he often experiences mercy or prosperity or favor or grace, how different is that than longing for? Please, God. Please. And what doesn't happen? It never comes. If that's the interpretation of the first line or line and a half, everything that flows has a different meaning than he experiences it often or always. Because if it experiences it often, then one of the things that Paul means is everything that happens to this person blow your mind, if you really think about it, is part of that experience of mercy. Because what does that then imply? If How many of you have read this for today? Okay, so most of you. Then what does that mean? All the bad stuff and the good stuff is what? It's part of that experience of mercy. In other words, this too was merciful for the person who experienced it. That's a huge difference than my life sucks. My Lord is dead. My family is dead. My people are dead. They're gone. Come on. I'm waiting. When am I going to experience it? It hasn't happened now. What often happens to people who get that way? I had, a, I had a graduate student, I'll stop with this because I'm going over. I had a graduate student years ago, Afghanistan vet, PTSD, relatively early on in the first semester, we got to this poem, he had to drop. It just sent off too many, because he was like, when's it coming? When's that mercy? Because I'm in the longing for it. Okay? All right. Um, so we didn't even get as far as I did in my first class, which is pretty amazing. I told you we'd get behind, and so we'll finish the semester with Beowulf, probably, and kidding. <laughs>